see you all again. I'm John Patterson Williams, and I am the policy coordinator for the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture. So thank you for joining us again this month as we're in the second of three webinars around carbon. And I would like to introduce our speaker this morning, who is Graham Gilchrist. He's from Biological Carbon Canada, uh, just housed just outside of Edmonton in the, the booming metropolis of Leduc. And we're really pleased that he can come here today. Uh, Graham has worked for about 35 years in the section intersection of sort of economics and environment. And for the last, since about 2007, I believe he's been working around carbon and their markets and how we value them and integrate with, with grassland and wetland and sort of natural ecosystems. So it looks like your fame precedes you, Graham. You're, you're drawing a crowd, which is nice. And as, as Ian indicated, we'd like to allow for sort of interactive purposes. Graham's requested that if you want to have your videos on or even your microphones on, but uh, you can, because then he can he can sense what's going on in the crowd and and react. Um, that does, you know, that means if you have kids around or livestock or animals or something, you um, want to keep them quiet. Not, you know, relating the two. But um, let's uh, let's welcome Graham so much, and we look forward to your talk this morning. Thank you, Graham. Well, thank you, John and Ian, and. If as long as everybody can hear me, you know, thumbs up if you can. We got your, so make sure we're we're live, and then we will get things shared here, and we'll we'll get started. So thank you, everybody. Uh, for thank you for the uh, introduction. Um, Graham Gilchrist is is my name, and and uh, oh shoot. Now I just have my slide deck, so we'll we'll carry on and then we'll go from there. Um, spent quite a few years with Alberta Agriculture, and now we're private uh, for about ten years. And we started this journey in carbon and markets, uh, really when Alberta came in in '07, and we continue on now. And Biological Carbon Canada now plays the space of of doing extension and and uh, helping farms, technology providers policy folks understand the nuances of this emerging commodity uh, that's now captured, you know, quite a bit of attention um, across Canada, North America, and in, in, in other jurisdictions. Biologic Car Carbon Canada is a nonprofit. Uh, we're an Alberta-based society dealing with the Canadian perspective. We do some private extension like we're doing here today. We do a little bit of lobbying, and we do a fair amount of intelligence gathering and then passing out to our members and folks that, that want to listen to us. Set the stage, because at the end of the day, from Biologic Car Carbon Canada's perspective, we've got to make it in reality of, of our farm and ranch. And so, give you perspective uh, 2023 data is just starting to come out but this is 2022 data uh most of my presentation will be on earnings so at the end of the day we're dealing with uh, gross farm revenue across canada uh slightly over 90 billion and by the time you pay for a few things earnings uh before income uh, interest uh, taxes uh land access so on and so forth there's about 32 billion dollars available to the to the farm uh to do things with and that's important as we relate then to the commodity this new commodity whether or not you're dealing revenue or whether or not you're trying to get a handle on on your farm expenses um a little bit of data like any good ag economist. So right now, uh, this is the earnings as a percentage of gross revenue for all Canadian farms. We bounced right along and we've been slowly building over the last 10 years. We're now up for 26%. That means for every dollar coming in, you've got 26 cents left to pay for entrance, to pay for taxes, to pay for land access costs, and ultimately, you know, for the pickup or, or new cupboards or something, what you want to do on the farm. So at, and it makes a challenge then because that is what we're trying to change when it, with this new commodity with either a protocol or a change in your your expense ratio and alberta perspective uh, this is all farms uh, we finally have some good alberta data at stats canada but as i said uh, trying to make this look like a market discussion uh, cost of goods sold seems to be pretty steady across uh, for the since 215 direct expenses are steady to up uh, your administration is fairly steady. The downside is 
Deepa, those earnings are slowly declining uh, from 215 to 2021. And if we look at the beef side of the sector, as hence uh, we bring this in because of grasslands, a uh, little bit uh, worse picture. Cost of goods sold continue to, to slowly move up over time. Uh, direct expenses, fuel, oil, things like that are are slowly creeping up. Your uh, administration and office seems to be straight steady. The downside is the DEPA as a percentage of revenue continues to decline. And so by the time we got down to uh, 2021, uh, 10 cents is left to pay for the other things other than cost of goods sold and so on and so forth. So the challenges are out there to why things need, why things are converting and and uh, the, the um, challenges in raising cows and calves across Alberta. Going to jump into a greenhouse gas emission primer and to give you an idea from our soil shields, a uh, little bit of uh, Ag Canada reporting. They they published a report in 2015, showed the change in organic matter um, and the soil sinks uh, back there. And so that then translates now into Environment Canada's uh, emissions reporting and the, the coefficients. So when you look at annual cropping, we've got uh, in the Alberta perspective, uh, we've got 100 minus 108, so the average farm that is in a cropping program generates a change, a positive change in the sink, about 108 kilograms per, per hectare. Uh, if we're into our blacks, we're up to uh, 862 kilograms. Uh, time we get into our Manitoba soils in the north part of Saskatchewan, we're getting near zero, but 86 uh, positive change in the sink, it's reported as negative. And then as we get to Eastern Canada, we've got a change in reality. We have the change in soils e emitting a, a carbon gas. And so, so they are, they are uh, losing soil sink, if you want to put it that way. And then when we come along and look at native range, so mainly in around 12, uh, our native grasslands are only changing positively. Uh, negative as a as a as a source uh, sink uh, at about 27 kilograms a hectare. So I think to, for the purposes of market discussion, the annual change in our grasslands does not move very quickly, and so any any offset has to deal with that slow change, and then you've got to give it a haircut for the purposes of building a protocol. Couple of things to remind everybody. Uh, federally, we've got a we've got a, a meter program, and then we've got a fuel surcharge, and those things are important as you look at uh, the policy framework of dealing with agriculture in the ag sector. So when we look at the 2020 emissions framework, we've got uh, ag energy and uh, ag energy that's subject to the levy, and then the rest of the emissions framework. We have our enteric fermentation, manure, our ag soils direct. Uh, urea and then burning so that that deals with what we're we're challenged with so this is the 2021 price we're going to go to 80 dollars a ton here in in uh, a couple weeks but right now across canada from the parliamentary budget office you're paying 57 million across canada for the levy that is attached to a non-exempt fuel mainly propane and natural gas we have then uh an exemption so the agriculture has an exemption from the tax. So normally you'd call this the purple fuel stuff. So you're not paying uh, 366 million because that's the size and scope of the exemption you're currently getting on the uh, the of the uh, fuel that you're taking. But we also have another uh, exemption because as a sector, you're not subject to the emission requirements under underneath the, the backstop program. Put that in perspective, uh, that's a $3.5 billion hit had we been subject to that. And so reminder that uh, your earnings were 32, uh, a little over 32 and a half billion. Uh, there would have been a 3.5 billion off the top of that had the sector been treated like any other polluting sector uh, across Canada. So when we look at agriculture, we're 10% we're of Canada in 2021. <laughs> And uh, if you want to uh, quickly bring this up, uh, animals are about 46% of that emissions framework. Uh, energy use on the farm at 21, 22%, and our annual cropping uh, across Canada is our 35% of that total 
that total pie. And if you want to ask particularly about what fuels are using, roughly a third goes to animals and roughly two thirds of that, that fuel then is spent by our annual cropping sector. This is the emissions framework. And if you, if you look at the top line, our enteric fermentation, it has gone up and then it's coming back down. It nicely matches what's happening with our herd inventory, dairy, beef, and all our other animals. A couple of things to realize though, that our ag energy, the purple line continues to, to move up and our ag soils, mainly from our purchase of fertilizers and, and things like that, it continues to, to move up. The uh, liming is still there. Uh, grasslands is actually in there. And then the squiggly line at the bottom is the change in soil sink uh, dealing with um, the cropping practices across Canada. And, it, and put it in a little different perspective, uh, the green line up and down is the net total. Uh, the blue line is our animal agriculture. The orange line is our, our annual ag and our ag energy is there as a purple. What's, why do we have a squiggly line? When you look at the coefficients being used within the reporting, they are static. So the ch why we're seeing an up and down change is we have an up and down change in the amount of lands within the inventory. So what you saw here is we had a growth in our farming inventory till about 2001. Then we saw land leaving the inventory uh, up all the way to 2011. And then we saw land coming back into the inventory particularly in Western Canada. So that movement up and down is why our sink data goes up and down. It's not the fact that we're getting any better with the ch annual change uh, for the coefficients. It's the number of lands within the inventory that makes that uh, number move up and down. So in, pr in that perspective, grasslands actually is a positive, which means it is contributing to the greenhouse gas sector. Why is that? Because those are lands leaving. Um, yes, uh, the coefficient uh, was minus 27. So for a static uh, acre or hectare of, of grassland, all, you know, with good management would improve its sink by 27 kilograms a, a hectare uh, because we have the losses and changes in grasslands at the end of the day, the data tells us we're in a we're in a positive situation, which means we are the grasslands at, in our sector are contributing to the greenhouse gas total. And for Alberta, for the primary sector here, uh, we're continuing to slowly creep up. We've somewhat steadied around 20,000 kilotons uh, part there, um, and we're not making any changes to go down. So who's buying? Why is this important? We've got a couple big ones. One is, and probably the most exciting part of this market is our scope three, two, and one emissions. And they are looking for and buying data associated with the emissions on your farm, emissions of your inputs and your energy emissions, ultimately coming to a package of how many total emissions you're coming from your farm. There is some land-based emissions that you can take off. Uh, at the end of the day, there is a footprint and that is going into the supply chains, whether it's General Mills or, or a pea plant here, we'll talk about shortly, that that, that footprint, that data package has value. Uh, it's, it's not a protocol, it's not being uh, funded by the government. You have real people buying real numbers because at the end of the day they are putting on to a label whether it's the uh, bag of pea flour or a wine bottle that this is the scope of all the emissions uh, attached to that 110 milliliter bottle of wine uh, glass of wine that you just bought so there's a bit of a secret sauce so you're starting with the iso design you're trying to understand the scope of the emission uh, of that particular framework. Then you're having a practice change. And as a result, there should be a change. So you're dealing with a change of emission or a change in avoidance. And there's some buffers and reserves that have to come out of that. Part of that is the permanence piece of uh, the, the um, removal or the reduction. 
you do have to take out the climate. So what that means is you can have a change in your soil sink, as an example, and not have a change in practice, but because you're getting either wetter or drier, you will see a change in that, that soil sink. And it also then talks about the evidence that you have to put into that to, to show that you've actually done something. And at the end of the day, a little bit of math, and, and by that time, you've got a certificate with a serial number that you can put on uh, the, the registry here in Canada. But a couple of things to understand. You start out with a, a number based on what we think the science would do. There's an approval framework. We're looking at what the best available science is, and it keeps changing. It looks at the evidence required, and you've got to have a clear chain of ownership. And by the time you get done, there's a bit of a haircutting process. So what you think that the total is uh, that you can sell into the market, most of our protocol designs then uh, give you a haircut so that the amount you're putting into the market is, is less than what you originally started with. And then you've got to go through this system. You've got a protocol, you've got a project then that is based on the evidence as, and processes required by the protocol. The verifier, a third party should be, uh, comes in and tests. Did the project get built as prescribed in the protocol? There is a serialization process then, including paying uh, to be on the CSA register, and then you've got a certificate at the end of the day that what is actually being sold to the final emitter or whoever you're wanting to sell it to. So it's not just one market. So how do you read this thing? Well, at the end of the day, you've got about 12 different markets uh, that's in, in Canada. And, and if you bring up my purple circle, everything to the right or everything included is what we would call the volunteer market. There is a serialized number system and then there's a non-serial. We've got a regulated market. So in, in Canada, we really only have two. We have the Canadian backstop system and then we have the Alberta market. Everybody else doesn't have an offset system. Ontario doesn't have one. Quebec has a bit of a one with unique to them. And then everybody else is subject to the backstop the rules. Um, then we have this very large voluntary sector. So we do have a serialized process and the Canadian grasslands protocol is a part of that. And I'll talk a bit about that in a bit. Uh, that's a part of the serialized system. Once we leave that, we're into the non-serialized discussions. So we have a cash market. Uh, we've got green bonds uh, uh, being put into the system and that green bond comes there with a caveat to the mortgage that you have to adopt uh, uh, sustainable practices to qualify for the, in the case of Maple Leaf, a 1% premium uh, in their in their $2 billion facility. We've got non-fungible tokens being sold in Alberta uh, into the uh, that uh, EGNS market based on the London Stock Exchange. We have green advertising, we have market access, and at the end of the day, insetting is in there. So it is the, the, the footprint of the supply chain ultimately coming up to, uh, let's say, a, a, a Mars bar or Snicker. Now, why do I use Mars bar? Because the that company has said that we would drop our total footprint for the amount of carbon going into selling that little Mars bar by up to 30%. So that means somewhere in the system, either the emissions going into making the Mars bar or the emissions coming from the chocolate, the peanut butter, the corn syrup, all the other things that go into the Mars bar uh, are going to have to drop to satisfy the requirements of the investors and, and so on and so forth. So I give you a quick understanding of what's happening you know, in real terms of what we can, we try to figure out what's happening. Right now, federally uh, and provincially, we've got our feed protocols that are out there. Uh, Alberta has several, and we just heard uh, not too long ago, our backstop, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at our, our feedlot protocols. And the only other one we have right now in the regulated system, Alberta has their nitrogen oxide 4R program. Uh, it was approved here earlier this year, and now we're seeing, waiting to see which one of the aggregators wants to take it on uh, to serialize that on behalf of Alberta farmers. In the voluntary space, we have uh, four. Well, I got three here, but understand we've got the grassland protocol in the perspective of our discussion around range today. The, the NERP is being offered in the volunteer sector, the conservation cropping protocol is out there, and we have a couple other American ones being 
tweaked, one of them being fed fed uh, the enteric fermentation one, uh, coming into the voluntary sector. We've got two good examples of, of supply chains buying data. First one is our Trust Bix, a verified beef plus system, um, giving you about a 20%, a $20 a head premium for the data package that goes with that animal being sold through that particular system. And then, as I said, I was talking about a pea plant. They are paying a, uh, they have a delivery contract with anybody selling peas. And two things are stapled to that delivery product. One is a crop rotation. So there's no wheat grown in the year prior to the peas. And there is a requirement to deliver greenhouse gas data. And they are paying a 30 cent premium uh, on that bushel of peas delivered with that contract for that, for that pea system. And then lastly, uh, Bayer and Nutrien have in-house systems. Uh, and General Mills has something similar to that. Uh, and as a result, uh, we're not quite sure of the price yet, but is sufficient to say that the, those that are interacting with it are getting a credit back into their in-house account uh, to pay off the fertilizer or herbicide bill because they are part of that in-house system. Mm -hmm. uh, what's happening on the regulated, non-regulated price? We've had a huge crash. And the main reason is our Securities Exchange Commission had an initial set of rules uh, last year. Our Canadian Securities Administrators did the same thing. And they said anybody putting things on their balance sheet, income statement, or notice to investors, that greenhouse gas declaration had to be material or real. And that saw a whole rewrite of voluntary uh, protocols and projects being withdrawn um, putting pressure down to pressure. And we had Vera now had some trouble with their tree protocol and that's put further pressure on these. So my little arrow says that our nature avoidance system, when this was published in December, we were down, we were at four. And now if we look at the CME, we're down below $1 a ton US uh, for the value of, of our, our nature-based solutions. If I bring this back though to a, uh, impact on your financial statement. The offset market offers about a half a billion dollar opportunity. It, yes, it does cost money to put cost the money. protocol, but it, it does add to the bottom line with this new opportunity of a commodity. If we take a look at the cropping sector and the assumption here is when we deal with our fertilizer emissions, you'd kind of want to put every ton that you bought beside the uh, uh, root zone. And you every as it gasses off, you want that gas to be picked up by the root, not you know the your neighbor through the wind. So that's a 1.7 billion dollar opportunity. And finally, if you take a hard look at your natural gas and diesel use, taking a hard look at how you've set up your combine and, and tractor to deal with a a uh, efficiency use of fertile uh, of diesel fuel rather than having the throttle putting a you know a dent in the firewall that has a change in your, your your direct expenses so at the end of the day you've got three different opportunities to add in this case you know 2.7 billion dollars to your your earnings uh, across a, you know all of canada's agriculture i'm going to jump in right now to deal with the protocol problem with the grasslands. And since we're talking to mainly to a grassland provider and tell you how it operates. So it starts with the understanding that you don't want that grassland converted to an annual cropping. So what happens is at the end of the day, you've got a sink and then you also have an avoided greenhouse gas from the, from the actual operations of a cropping. And that then deals with the that that offset production so that that uh, par that, that part of the grassland above the baseline and part of the um, avoided conversion starts the discussion of how many tons are are, are going to be in that discussion so we did this for for I was down in the county Warner so we actually put this to 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 some some real numbers so in the rangeland down there uh, organic matter in our in our top uh, A horizon is about 4.2%. Uh, we're just below 1% in our B horizon. Bulk density is about 1.15. So that means that that strata in this particular um, rangeland sample, uh, that sinks about 86 tons uh, per hectare. 
in, in that column. The grassland, the cropland beside it, little less uh, organic matter in the A horizon, slightly more in the B horizon. There is a change in bulk density, but at the end of the day that you're dealing with a, a column of soil in the cropland beside the rangeland at 58 tons. So in this particular case, we're starting with a delta between those two columns is about 28 tons that the, 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 um, the protocol is, is trying to protect. And that matches uh, what uh, Ed Bark and crew at the U of A have been doing, talking about, you know, what's the size of the sink? Little hard to talk about the annual change, but you know, mixed grasslands sitting there at um, uh, 70 to 80 uh, uh, tons a hectare. And at the time we get to the foothills uh, and things like that, we're, we're creeping up to that 180, 190 bit. So depending on where you're in the province, you're starting with a, a delta as you apply that, the protocol. So in the case, uh, we're dealing with land ownership. So this is the the the, the Milk River watershed, uh, since this was the topic. Uh, public lands doesn't qualify. So it only deals with private grasslands, private long-term forage stands that starts with the other uh, qualification. And so then we're looking for in this case, uh, targets of where we would have those long-term pasture and private uh, native range. So some opportunities up uh, just off of the Milk River Ridge in this particular case of, of where you might want to have those discussions, uh, some possibilities as you get close to Aiden Wild Horse, and some possibilities off the shoulder of the Cypress Hills. So to start with uh, trying to find private Grasslands that qualify are difficult in a, in the vast majority of this uh, of this range of this uh, watershed are public land. We're also then looking for the land capacity, and why this is important is because you're trying to figure out the risk of conversion. And so this is for the county of Warner, uh, the average value of lands being traded and the average value in 2022 uh, ranged anywhere from 2000 to $6,000 uh, given out. Why is that important? Is because the, the cropland was uh, uh, trading for six grand an acre, private range was playing for two. So there's a gradient and that's, what we want to try to, to deal with. The, the land that has the highest gradient gets the fullest output of the protocol. So if the, 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 the ratio between the grassland and the cropland is less than 40, there is by, by agreement within the protocol, there is no economic pressure. Once you hit 40%, you get half the output. And by the time you get to 100% or doubling, uh, it is assumed that you would have full pressure and you get a full, there is no discount to the number of tons that the, uh, the, op, the, the output of the protocol. <clears throat> and then you take that 28 tons in my example and you run it out over a 30 year time frame. So by the time you get done, you're, you're able to put on the market over the lifetime of the 30 year, uh, 18 tons a, a hectare. Little bit of math and you got to pay for the project costs. So as I said, you're you're starting from a small ton output. And since we're dealing with the volunteer space, we're dealing with less than a ton an acre, a ton, a, a dollar a ton, uh, unless you can convince somebody to buy it more for, for the uh, economic uh, discussion of what do you think that offset might be worth. The other thing, is and thank you for those with Dutch Limited. Uh, there is a permanence piece, so it's 130 year permanence. Uh, there are uh, anybody that qualifies to, to can do sustainable easements, and in this case, uh, ducks, nature conservancy, legacy, and, and salt were a part of the original pilot. And all that's required, though, uh, was a is a dollar uh, instrument. Uh, the rest, the, the all these other trusts certainly may wish to add to the discussion of what that management agreement might look like. But all that's required is a single piece of paper for a dollar buying the permanence uh, for 130 years. A couple of the other stuff we do just to fill, round out uh, some of the discussion. We do have an, on our website, we do have an on-farm calculator uh, that does both the, the sink and the emissions. And at the end of the day, you then have a, a starting point for any farmer ranch of where actually are you uh, on an annual basis. 
We do talk about EGNSs and to remind everybody that most of EGNSs are public. So unless you ha can put and have attributes of a property right around them, they are very difficult to put into the market. And, and that might make you feel good that you have these EGNSs, but until you've got the right to do something with them, uh, they have no market value. And some of our hard discussions we have with folks out there. Uh, we did this work for our Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association to give them a roadmap on the forages, native range and one, and we did one for tame forages, of, of the type of data we need. So you're starting with, it's not just one mix. If we're talking about our prairie grasslands, you've got to understand then what happens, what's the difference in our semi-arid versus a humid or the grasslands on a boreal shield, they're down in mixed woods. You're starting with, excuse me here, forgot to shut off my ringer. You're dealing with the types of grass zones and then you're now getting into the type of scopes down to the woody financial, I should say dead litter, carbon, and so, so forth. So what are the management gaps and what do we have for uh, greenhouse gas data for each one of those little individual zones? Uh, we're talking about maintaining the sink. Can you actually me measure a change over the long term? Our uh, Environment Canada data suggests we're at the minus 27, but that is, you know, that's, that's across the whole network. So is there a small change? Is What's the difference between semi-hued and uh, semi-arid in those grasslands? Uh, ultimately, yes, we do have the grassland protocol, but there are other protocols uh, that you, uh, you may wish to look at. And at the end of the day, you've got some boundaries. So that means that ultimately that reduction or, or change in the sink has to be real. It's got to be conservative, uh, permanent. There's no leakage. You've got a verified system and you've got a hard traceability of the evidence that you, you've got to go through. A couple of things we did. Uh, I talked a bit about last time is we we got asked to take a look at what a 25 year uh, management agreement might look like to 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 stop the conversion rather than a, a long term permanent. And so we took a look at uh, some time value of money of what might be out there, including, you know, a, a risk rate somewhat free of risk uh, 3.25. We had a couple versions of time cost of money that ranged from six to seven. And then we put into the mix, you know, some economic research that suggests farms and ranches actually have up to a 28% discount rate for their money. We used the uh, cap rate approach to figure out what that might, and we gave ultimately a, a series of numbers that might suggest opening offers for discussions uh, with a high net present value giving us $1,800 $1, to almost a risk-free approach uh, at $15,000 uh, an acre. So that we tried to inform some folks of what that opening offer might be using the cap, cap rate approach uh, to valuing uh, both the loss of earnings and change in capital gains. We also spent some time with some folks understanding best practice. So number one, the, the, uh, you need good evidence. So just because you've got green skies, pictures of birds, uh, you need to be able to, to actually have evidence that can be verified to do that. Um, claims and warranties being made, uh, the protocol has to get built. If you don't have one coming from best science, uh, there's a verification process, tracking use, and then the, then the market entry is pushing back with those those uh, challenges. You know, is it real? Is it verified? Is it exclusive? Can you trace it? And is that change permanent? So if you're having a change in, in EGNS or a bioindex, as an example, that change has to be permanently moving upward. Any shrinkage back uh, either has to be dealt with with a discount or uh, that ranch might have to pay some money back if that biodiversity uh, slips. We do spend some time uh, trying to understand uh, best practice. So the best gold example is our protocol. And by the time you get up to green advertising, it's really difficult to understand exactly other than telling the world that you're green, uh, the data behind it falls apart very quickly. Our last message we talk about at BCC is, is the fact that every transaction in all the markets we talked about are all bilateral. 
There are no market rules that we currently enjoy with selling grain, selling livestock, selling a car or a house uh, here. So there is no requirements for a license. There are no requirements for a grade. There are no requirements for payment certainty and there are no requirements for transactional certainty. So because those four securities exist in other transactions, market securities, bonds as an example, or buying grain, this is missing. So it makes it very difficult to have a mar functioning market out there. And we currently caught one of our senators some, saying something very important in the debate around when they were talking about two, three, four. This is the fact that a tax on fuel and a government program does not make a market. And without these four securities uh, or any type of legislation, uh, Canada will lag behind the US. The USDA got to be the market regulator last year with the farm bill and now their market will expand now because the USDA is now accountable to deliver licenses, grade, payment security, and transaction security. Thank you. As I close out here before questions, just a reminder that you got to bring receipts. You just can't shout out there that you're green and I'm doing something or I've got the size of the sink, so I should be good. Uh, join us. We would certainly welcome you as members uh, individually or as your corporations to be a part of what we do here today. And I turn it back to our two leaders here if, for a question and answer. So thank you for the time of, of talking here this morning. Great. Thank you very much, Graham. And I'm sure, yeah, lots of information in that presentation and lots to sort of process and think about. Maybe I'll start off with a question. What was that last slide? How did that infer the tree with the tractor on it? What did? Well, how <laughs> did you end up there? <laughs> I see. Very good. All right. I see we do have uh, some questions in the chat, but we have about 10 minutes of. Um, I, have, to... I have more than 10, but certainly, you know, we'll, we'll answer if yeah. we can, you know, as best yeah. we can here, John. Perfect. Thanks, Graham. All right, I see Glenn Friesen, you had uh, a question in the chat around emission and sequestration data and sort of intensity. Um, and then also followed up around, is your online calculator using Holos in the background? So Glenn, did you want to elaborate? And people can turn on their videos now too, if you like. I'm still chewing, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> that gives Graham time to formulate his thoughts here. Yep. Thanks. Graham, that was a great, great talk. I, I have to watch the recording. There's a lot of detailed information in there. And this is, this is, um, I need to learn this over a week. Um, so I, I, I didn't ask it yet, but when you say join as a, as a member, have governments joined BCC? Um, no, it, so to answer this question, I can get funding today if I wanted to track worms. Or I want to deal with the next best. Farming practice with no data, but the minute I talk about a market instrument. Um, both both um, both the uh, traditional funders, Environment Canada, Ag Canada uh, run away. It is a really hard discussion to get funding to talk about market instruments. So to be fair, so we we have private members, we have corporate members that what we do, and at the end of the day, you know, we're trying to fulfill their needs. We have commission members uh, because part of the technical stuff we talk about has policy implications. So we're providing uh, policy briefs for our members and so on and so forth. I'm going to call you after Graham because I got an idea uh, okay. that we, we could do something uh, together on, on this here in, Man in Manitoba. We're small enough and nimble and there's there's a few key people that are interested in talking more about the markets and more about the, getting the value chain to support this avoid, avoid a conversion or the transition to a some kind of stable practice. Yeah, you know, multiple definitions there, but there is. Yeah, you mentioned it. Uh, we we are talking to the companies you have highlighted earlier that are paying these premiums. So, it makes sense maybe for us to do something on that. But so back to my question. Uh, 
on the earlier on you had you talked about total emissions across yep. the sector i was curious if you've been if it, i'm sure people have been but if you have the data that tr tracks intensity of those emissions based on well i did factor, uh, right? i have different slides then i have we also track the intensity because it's a big part of the argument in our sector today right so it it, it starts with the top number and there is certainly argument of what that top number should be. So whether or not you're using the official policy data that Environment Canada publishes, both for acres in the system and the emissions. And then you've got a whole bunch of other folks changing the conversation of the top number. The dairy industry, as an example, are using two LCAs doing about 10 years apart. So they're not using official data from Environment Canada. They've built their own. And the, the last paper from the um, uh, Canadian Roundtable of Sustainable Beef did some intensity. Uh, they did a whole host model and came up with a different set of numbers uh, than what uh, 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 Environment Canada publishes. And then they did it on intensity on the amount of beef uh, uh, box beef produced. So if you look at the, in general, the emissions intensity for earnings are getting better. And the only reason is the growth in earnings are moving quicker than the growth in greenhouse gases. Yeah. If you look at emissions per acre, it's going what you'd call the wrong way. We have emissions growth and we have acres in the inventory shrinking. So the emissions per acre are rising. If we deal with emissions per, uh, this causes a really good example, um, nutrient densification. Uh, there was a couple of papers. The emissions per calorie. You have a different framework then of uh, which one is good or bad. So we have to why we've stayed with gross because that is what the policy framework is. At the minute you put something in the bottom, then you're dealing with literally somebody's advertising plan. And, and you, you, we have great debate of what goes in the bottom number, whether it's acres, pounds per cow, both are going up, you know, as an example in the beef sector. But the minute you put uh, meat, you know, all of red meat, for, for in the livestock sector, you've got a really a good explosion of that efficiency getting better because our amount of, particularly in our pig industry, uh, the amount of protein going into the market continues to grow. We're not, you know, and in the case of our our livestock out there, we're not getting, you know, we're not getting in the triplets or, you know, we still have one calf a year, but the amount of cuttable beef coming off that carcass continues to grow over time. So that, that grows. So it, it, it's a great debate around what goes in the top number and how somebody wants to frame their message by putting whatever they wish into the bottom number. Great, thanks Glenn for that question and, and Graham lots we could dig into there, but I wanna move to, we have a question from Florence Devier. Uh, is your recommendation that a clearer regulated offset market needs to be built? And are the current prices anywhere near what is needed to supplement the farm income? And Florence, you could articulate your question better than I just did. So if you want to elaborate, please do. I just I got the sense, Graham, that it's the Wild West out there. <laughs> and, and I was just trying to figure out what are your recommendations kind of for next steps? Is it really we need to focus on the offset market and get that cleaned up? Is it actually some of these other intermediate tools that you noted have value? Maybe we need to work on those and then ultimately are any of these tools actually enough to achieve the conservation elements that we're looking for, um, which is you know protecting grasslands, for example, given the economics that you were putting out in the beginning? So two questions, possibly three, not sure. Okay, so let's talk about let, you know let's see who you work for first. So let's let's talk, let's talk about the you know the the next best protocol coming out of Environment Canada. Just because you have a protocol doesn't mean you have a functioning market. So the at best, I would stick my neck out and say, take the Canada Grains Act, pull out grain, insert carbon, and you have a natural piece of legislation that would regulate the four things we talked about. License around who can transact, uh, 
quality understanding of what the grade is for any carbon instrument, whether it's a federally regulated offset for venturing one or, you know, an off or a, a carbon instrument from an, a from a private producer and contract standards. So all of those four things the USDA are doing today as a regulator, regardless of what market. So just because you've got a protocol and just because you've got a price on fuel doesn't make a market. And so you need market certainty, just like you would buy and sell a home, buy and sell a car, buy and sell grain in this pro in, in Canada, to, to answer your question that way. The, the economic question you asked is McKinsey and a few other folks have, have tried to get their hand around the cost of abatement. What's the cost on the farm to capture a ton of either reduction or avoidance? Right now, on average, it's about 100 US. Some of the ones are, are, are down to 40. Others are certainly, you know, past 100. So each technology has its own cost abatement. And so the, as the, as the regulated price now will go to 80, it is getting near to the point where that price less discount and basis uh, may be sufficient for me to take a hard look at that offset as a cost as a cost abatement piece to adopt the technology. If you're dealing with anything within the voluntary sector, you're not even close. Uh, CME right now, as I said, was uh, you know less than a dollar. So the the all of this all of the markets I talked about have a challenge in exactly what's a ton, how is it measured, is it real, and how, how are you going to enforce that? So it it would just because the minister both at Alberta or or Canada can des decide whether or not they're going to accept the certificate uh, for compliance. That's only one part of that whole chain around a quality product, a quality project. Uh, nobody playing silly buggers in the middle. You know, I bought it, but not paying for it. We've, sh you know, licensing to ensure that you, you know, you are doing it. Payment certainty. You know, in the fact that, you know. If I use the Canadian grains example, you've got to put up a bond to cover your, your purchases as an example. So that is what we continue to struggle to argue about that regardless of the ton, whether it's regulated or a private ton sold by Nutrien, you need market regulation. In that we don't have it, US now has it, and so their volunteer space will move way quicker in any type of adoption because they have market certainty within that transaction framework. Thanks, that's very helpful. And it, I think what I'm hearing you say is that if we had that market certainty, it actually opens up the possibility of multiple different tools being developed, whether in the voluntary or the regulatory markets, but that certainty kind of remains regardless of wh whether it gets used for insetting or whether it gets used for offsetting or <laughs> any yes. other kind of setting that we can think of, I guess. Yeah, so it would mean things like that you can't, you can't have in the private sector your registry, your verifier, and your project developer all can't be within the same company, which we have in a few situations. So verification should be third party. The registry should be third party from the project uh, proponent, you know, things like that in the we kind of see it in the CSA registry and our regulated side. Once you go into the private sector, we have folks offering all four services, you know, and they're they're thinking they're going to buy something from a farmer rancher in Canada. So and then we're dealing with you've just signed a contract that's dealing with uh, enforceable in Texas only versus Canada law. So anyway, yeah, you've got me really down in the weeds there, Florence. So <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Grant? Jordan, should the slides be changing? Seeing still seeing the CO2 sinking in the Canada graph. Looks like we sorted that one. OK, OK. Um, it's, it's his computer issue. It always happens to me. So, too. To answer the question about Holos in the background. So what we've done is took 
Holos out of it. We have we our calculator is based on the Environment Canada uh, coefficients, so it has some limitations. And we're we're working right now with Holos College um, and a bit of a funding package uh, to further expand. To give an example, uh, Environment Canada has one coefficient per one beef animal. That's it. And if you're going to further understand what happens, then uh, 76, 79 kilograms uh, a year. If I, uh, but we don't understand well within the science what's the cow calf segment of that number, what's the uh, straight the grain and feedlot part of our system, what's the backgrounding and the grain and so on and so forth. So we, we need better understanding of the coefficients to do that. Holos is a good model, but it's starting from the other end of the system. And the and so what we've done is just taking we've our calculator takes known coefficients and allows you to have an understanding of what's happening on your farm, rather than starting at the very complicated end of exactly how many uh, kilograms of corn did I feed last year and what was their DME uh, as a part of of going from that side. Does that make sense? I think so, Graham. So what you've done, you've simplified it a little bit. And I've tried. And you, yeah. 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 Okay. As an FYI, well, we have some holes. We have some holes, and be frankly about it, you know, the 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 one coefficient for grass minus twenty seven. So we we need to track down what that grass coefficient is for the far side of um, uh, uh, Winnipeg versus the far side of P uh, Summerside PEI. You know, it, it's not quite a full Canadian model yet because for the purposes of reported science, we have holes in in that. Okay, thanks, Graham. Uh, Florence, you have another question. I do, if there's time, sorry. I was sure, really... Well I was really interested about your slides on baselines, Graham. Our program is often having to think about avoided conversion baselines. And so um, I was wondering the extent to which you had done that work in other places, kind of looking at the price of land and how it aligns. And if you've found that, that that's been kind of a useful way for you to think about baselines and if you've expanded it beyond, you know, the area that you showed us. Oh, so the... You were when I was talking about the grassland protocol or the or the one about informing uh, buying uh, management agreements. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I feel like I was processing information. It might have actually been in the grassland one. I think it was the one where you focused in on a specific. I oh, want to okay. say it's milk right. something. Milk <laughs> so, so what I did there was try to explain how the grassland retention protocol functions in the real world. So in and so it is a retention protocol. So it is designed to keep the grassland intact. And the 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 um, and from that is you end up with a particular amount and it would be unique across different sectors, you know, across Canada. But the premise is the same. You're trying to understand what the the keeping the sink is, and then you don't have to eat the greenhouse gas uh, from the cropping, and that that then you start with a a particular amount available to start the discussion. So in the case of the Milk River watershed, you know, with some real data, it was 28 tons. If you took this to uh, native range outside Leduc here, you'd have a different spread between the the two of them. Got me so far? Then the other thing is, it, this came from, it, it was a U.S. protocol adopted for Canadian specific things. So down in the States, they've got really good data understanding rental rates, as an example for cropland. And up here, we had to do something different. So they tried to look at the change in crop values. So in real terms in that Milk River area, uh, cropland was at six grand trading for, for some of those soils and the county warner and the grassland was trading at two so that that is a large uh uh coefficient beyond 100 percent so all t so in this particular case all 28 tons uh 
the, 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 what you don't lose if you convert goes into the system. If the ratio of grassland was less than that, let's say the grassland trading value was at two and the cropland was trading at, at the three, you're less, you're below 40%. So there is no challenge for conversion. Got me so far? Then the, uh, there was a 30 year payout program. So, so at total, after you do all the haircutting, you're putting onto the market over time, 18 tons in this example. The downside, Florence, you're dealing, even though you think you've got 18 tons for sale, you're not, you, you know, unless, uh, unless your folks uh, there want to make it a regulated ton, uh, we're dealing with less than a, a ton, a, a dollar a ton, regard there. So even though the mechanics are really good at protecting it with the 130 year easement, the price on the voluntary space is not great. Good. Well, thank you for that question and response, Graham. Just looking at time, and we're, I think we want to wrap up here so we can honor that 11 o'clock deadline. Um, but thank you. Thank you for those questions, and I'm sure there's many more. And so I did note that there was, I think Stuart Slattery had asked if there was a chance to get a copy of the presentation itself. I'm not sure if you're willing or want to do that, Graham. Um, I can maybe provide the well, email. I, what I can do is I'll put it in PDF. And, and sure. share it with you. Understanding, folks, I have a, I, my style of presentation is I have pictures in a very few words, so yep. I don't present with a whole lot of text. So yep. you're going to miss all the nuance by doing that. But I'd be glad to to I'll sure. put our logo on it and copyright on it, and I'll I'll share it with you. Sure, that's great, and you can pass to me if you need that. So. All right, thank you, Graham. We appreciate this. And thank you, Evan, for coming. And just two points to note. Uh, one is we will have uh, next month uh, the session, I believe it will be on April 17th, and that will be the Smart Prosperity Institute out of Ottawa. Um, uh, Sarah Olmsted and I believe Jeff McCarney will, will sort of possibly co-present something on sort of carbon um, transitions and some of the current research they're doing there. So uh, it sort of follows along with this theme. So I hope you can make it to that one and, and stay tuned for an invite. And then a slight aside, but related to the grassland talk, is that if you're interested uh, next Thursday, I believe it is the 22nd of March, the Canadian Grassland and Forage uh, Association will be having their Grassland Summit where they're sharing information about the Canadian Grassland Inventory. So if you haven't received uh, a note on that, please reach out to me and I can make sure you can you get the invitation. All right. Thank you again. Appreciate your time. Graham, round of applause resounding and uh, have a wonderful day, everyone. John, one more question. I think uh, just I see there. Uh, if this is recorded, it will be on your YouTube channel channel at some point, right? That's correct. By this afternoon, good catch. It will be up on the <laughs> PHTV YouTube channel, which I put the link in earlier, or you can just Google PHTV YouTube, uh, and you'll see these presentations. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank Bye. you, folks. Well, thank you, John. Great. Thank you, Graham. I really appreciate it. I haven't heard you specifically present before, so you do a great job. Have a good style. So thank you well, for thank that. You. Yeah. There's a lot there. I for, yeah. It, it, but there you, is. you've got to you, uh, you've got to look at it. You know. Yeah. Uh, as a as a whole perspective. So yeah. Yeah, you do. And so thank you for that. And I look forward to having more conversations with you as we carry on this road on grasslands. So. Sounds good, John. <laughs> Alrighty. Take good. care. Yeah. Bye-bye.